Welcome, everybody. Uh, how wonderful to welcome you today to uh, our first webinar from the ESE, the Environmental and Sustainability Ed and Teacher Education uh, Network. We're really pleased to welcome you to this session today, and uh, I'm really looking forward to a wonderful sharing of information. I am one of the co-chairs of the network. My name is Hilary Inwood. I'm also a faculty member at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. I know that you are coming in from all over North America today. I know we had some interest even as from a far afield as Australia for this webinar, but when they heard it was going to be recorded, they decided not to be up in the middle of the night, and they decided instead to, uh, to listen to the, the recording afterwards. So very happy to welcome you all today. This um, webinar today is being um, sponsored or brought to you by uh, a network that is existing in Canada. We're officially the standing committee of uh, ECOM, which is our national environmental education group. Uh, we call ourselves ESETE for short, um, and we, uh, we really are looking forward to learning a little bit more about what you're doing uh, across um, the country and in other places uh, as you're making this shift uh, of environmental and sustainability ed uh, and teacher education to online teaching environments. This is a little overview of what we'll be doing today. We're going to start with uh, a land acknowledgement. Um, I will be bringing and introducing you to uh, four of my colleagues who are very kindly offered to share their expertise today. Paul Elliott, Patrick Howard, Jeff Stickney, uh, myself, and also Rebecca Franzen. And then we've got some um, next steps and resources to share with you as well. So we're very happy to, uh, to bring all of that to the webinar today and to uh, share this with others who can't join us in person but can catch the recording. I've been doing artistic land acknowledgements with my students uh, as of late. I think this is a, a wonderful way to introduce the work of Indigenous artists you may recognize this artist for those of you who are here from Ontario. It's the work of Norval Morceau. Um, I will tell you that um, Morceau is an Anishinaabe artist who is considered by many to really be sort of the grandfather or the uh, Nishomis of contemporary Indigenous art in Canada. His uh, other name is Copper Thunderbird. Uh, he was raised in Sandpoint uh, Ojibwe community and he has a very unique artistic style that's recognizable, uh, quite easily recognizable. And it's really pushed the bounds of visual storytelling for all artists in Canada. He's known as the originator of the Woodland School of Art, and he uh, use, has used this to portray traditional stories, spiritual themes, and political messages in his work. And uh, this particular one is, I believe, found up in, in Ottawa. I don't know if Giuliano can, uh, can confirm that for us, but I understand it's part of the collection of the National Gallery of Art. I will just uh, now follow up with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that sacred land on which all of our communities operate, um, that these have been sites of human activity for thousands of years. These lands are the territories of different Indigenous peoples, depending on where you are joining us from today. Here in Toronto, which is where I am, uh, we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. This territory was the subject of the Dish of the One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in the Confederacy of the Anishinaabe and Allied Nations to peaceably care and share for the resources around the Great Lakes. This agreement is concerned with taking only what we need, leaving enough for the next one and cleaning up after ourselves. Great advice for environmental educators, I think. Today, the meeting place of Te Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island and around the world, and we're very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this territory. And for those who might be joining from the states, I would point out that doing land acknowledgements is becoming, has become really common in uh, educational institutions in Canada. It's our way of uh, really uh, recognizing the long history of our Indigenous peoples, wherever we might be in the country. And they really are seen as just a starting point, a way to begin the learning process with our students of uh, who has been on our land and the contributions they bring up uh, to learning, teaching and learning uh, in our communities. Okay. With that in mind, uh, we are going to uh, slide right into our first presenter for today. So I'd like to introduce you please to Paul Elliott, who's a professor at the School of Education and Professional Learning at Trent University. Uh, that's in Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, I have really had the pleasure of working with Paul for a number of years. And I can uh, speak from experience that he's just a fantastic educator. I think his students would probably agree. He's been working closely with uh, Jacob Rodenberg of Camp Kawartha. Um, and running what he's called an eco-mentor program for teacher candidates since 2010, which inspired many of us here in Ontario, actually, to do similar programs with our students. He has research interests in environmental education and works with a variety of organizations to promote this, including serving on the board of the Canadian Network for uh, Environmental Education and Communication, that's the 
aforementioned Ecom. He's originally from England, uh, but has been enjoying living in Canada and Ontario specifically since 2007. Welcome, Paul. Thanks very much, Hilary. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to our webinar this afternoon. Um, I want to kick us off by just sharing three different ideas that I've been using and um, that I intend to continue using and I think my students enjoy. So, um, can we mm -hmm. go to the next slide, Harry? Thank you. Great. So, um, none of these ideas are completely original. Um, I picked them up from various places. And I, the first one I'd like to flag up is the Beatles Project, which is a California-based group who devise environmentally themed outdoor activities, specifically for the sciences. But I think some of their activities can be used much more widely than that. You might want to check out their website because not only are the ideas there, but in several cases, they have um, really useful video records of their educators using the techniques with children. So those are really valuable, I think, in teacher education as well. I'm going to share my favorite activity, and it's one of my favorites because although my background is in science, um, I do think environmental education needs to reach into all corners of the curriculum. And this activity is great for other things such as inspiring creative writing activities, in inspiring visual arts activities, for instance. And I'm going to be using this um, this coming Saturday morning in the first of our remote um, eco-mentor workshops that Jacob Rodeberg and I will be running. And um, I've invited the students that are coming to that to bring a leaf, a fallen leaf from a tree with them. This activity works really well with leaves, but you can use any natural objects. So um, I'll be using breakout rooms for this. So students will go into a breakout room with just one other person. And they take turns looking at their leaf. And as many times as they can in the time available, they have to start a sentence with the word, I notice. Because this activity is all about observation and encouraging people to observe the natural world. And through observing the natural world, then we, we become connected to it. And once we're connected to it, we care about it. And we want to do things to protect it. So first of all, they look at their leaf and they say, I notice. And then if we go to the next slide, then having shared some of the things that they've noticed, they're then asked to talk to their partner and start their sentences with the word, I wonder. So they might wonder what's been eating my leaf. They might wonder what caused that black spot on my leaf. They might wonder why is this leaf changing color? Why do leaves change color during fall? Why do leaves fall off the trees in the fall? So they can do any sort of wondering that they like, and then that would be followed by a short group discussion around what things they wondered about their leaf. And then the final uh, stage, next slide, it reminds me of. Now that shows a, a, a gradual progression of higher level thinking because now they're being asked to look at their leaf and make connections. So they might say it reminds me of a map or it might, reminds me, might remind me of the structure of something else, for instance. So um, it's, it's a great little activity. It's very useful in science, I think, for a jumping off point for inquiry-based learning. So having identified where their leaf has been eaten, that could lead them to an investigation to try and find out what it is that's eaten their leaf, for instance. Um, I'm always amazed how powerful this exercise is because quite a few of my teacher candidates are very reluctant to simply drop their leaf on the ground. 
after this exercise. They want to take it home. They have connected with that leaf. They feel it is their leaf. And if that happens with adults, just imagine how powerful that could be with children. So I really recommend that exercise. I also recommend that you check out the Beatles Project website. Okay, next thing I want to talk about briefly. Um, this is uh, an online website called Mentimeter, which I was actually introduced to this summer. I was teaching an environmentally themed course to a group of master's students. And at one point they had to make their own presentations and one used this for her presentations. I had not yet used it specifically for environmental education, but I did use it with uh, my group of students who want to be high school biology teachers. So in this first case, um, I asked them to indicate how they feel about the prospect of teaching different biological subjects, whether they felt um, intimidated, scared at the prospect, or really enthusiastic. And it automatically gen generates on the screen the graph showing the response. But the great thing about Mentimeter, A, it's free. B, there's a whole range of different facilities that you can integrate. So you can produce results of all different kinds. And I'm just sharing two examples with you this afternoon. So that's the first example. I'll show you the next example, which is perhaps more familiar. So it, you can also use it to generate word clouds. So in this case, this, this was from my first session with a new group of students. I just asked them, they had to type in their three favorite biology topics and it generated a, a word cloud, which is actually very useful for me because it shows me that there's great enthusiasm for genetics and human physiology, but there's maybe one person out there who's keen on entomology, for instance. So it's, helps me to start build a, building a picture of the, the interest of the class, um, but also helped me identify topics where perhaps they need a little more help to see the potential in that subject and to become more enthusiastic for it. Um, so that's that one, check out Mentimeter. You can pay for upgrades, but actually the basic free version is really sophisticated and gives you a great choice of ways in which you can get your students um, interacting in live time. And it also automatically saves each of the, the pictures for you at the end and emails you a link so that you can keep the result, which is very valuable. And I think there's a lot of potential here for use in environmental and sustainability education. Last thing I want to share with you, I'm sure some of you will know about, and that's an app, the Seek app. Now you may also have heard of iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a citizen science app um, which allows you to photograph species and it, it then gets looked at by scientists across North America who are part of the um, iNaturalist team and um, people suggest what species it is that you've got. Seek is like the little brother or little sister of iNaturalist in that it simply uses um, photo recognition technology. So you photograph an animal or a plant or a fungus and it's pretty good at telling you what species you've got. So tomorrow I'll be working with my biologists. I'm going to send them out, I've asked them to upload this app to their smartphone or their iPad. I'm going to send them out and they're going to explore their uh, proximity, looking for species that they can identify. And just to put a, a particular theme to it, I'm giving them a list of invasive plant species that I would like them to um, see if there are any around. So we have a lot of invasive species in Ontario. And yes, the app is free to download. Uh, so, I have used it the last couple of years with students and they really, really love it. It's not totally reliable. I had one student who came back after we'd been in the field and she pointed at one of her friends and it said human. She pointed it at another friend and said mammal. The friend was most, most upset about that. But anyway, 
There we go. Thank you, Paul. Thanks so much. If you have any questions for Paul, oh, I think you already yeah, answered I, the question from Juliano about whether Seek is a free app, but it is a free app, right? It is a free app. It does geotag and it does also record. Um, so it is designed primarily for children, um, but I think it's good also for adults who are not perhaps committed enough for iNaturalist. Um, and it does provide various little challenges and so on. Um, which are designed for, for younger users. They can sort of collect points and so on for the number of species they found in a certain amount of time and things like that. That's great. So check and it out. Michelle also recommends uh, Leaf Snap, which uh, Michelle, I'm with you. I've been using that this summer. It works actually really well on plants. So um, that's been really helping me with my plant, work on my plant identification for sure. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Paul. So at this point, I would like to uh, introduce our second speaker, and that is uh, Dr. Patrick Howard. Uh, Patrick is uh, a member of our ESETE network. He's on the, the committee. Thank you, Patrick, for that. Um, he's a professor of education. He's also the interim dean of the School of Education and Health at Cape Breton University in Nova Scotia. He's the academic lead of the MED program. They have a wonderful program there. It's on sustainability, creativity, and innovation. And he's a member of the Ecom Standing Committee, that's us, uh, on environmental and sustainability ed and teacher ed. His most recent publication is called Living Schools, Transforming Education, just out in 2020. It's an edited collection with Dr. Catherine O'Brien, who does wonderful work on sustainable happiness, if you're not familiar with it. So welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Hillary, and, and thanks for the, the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed and pleased with such a, a wide and varied uh, audience with us uh, and people coming, I guess, with all different levels of, of experience in, in online teaching and uh, maybe synchronously or asynchronously and uh, working with people uh, spread across maybe even the globe, uh, who, who knows. But I just wanted to talk a little bit today about uh, uh, building, building relationships in the online space and, and to even narrow that down a little, a little closer to, to using video. We all like to use uh, videos and share videos. So um, just a couple of, of, of tips and, and, and uh, resources that, that uh, I've used in, in, the, in the past. And I'm, I'm also learning to use. This is a learning opportunity for us all. Our MED has been online. Uh, Betsy Jardine is with us. So she's a colleague at Cape Breton University as well and, and, and teaches uh, with us. So we're, we're always learning on these things. So just to, to, get, to get going, just before our current uh, shift to, to COVID and the online teaching and learning, I've been thinking about, we've been thinking about how environmental and sustainability education can, can influence uh, meaningful ways what, what happens in the online space. Uh, we think about adapting online uh, methods onto our teaching, but how can we move it the other way? So there has been a lot of work done in, in online learning around building relationships, and they really talk about um, uh, three presences that are necessary for online uh, learning to reach its full potential. So we can go to the next slide. And um, We've all heard the perennial gripes about online learning, just very isolating. Uh, you're working on your own, especially if there's a lot of asynchronous. But we also know now that synchronous is not always the best as well, sitting in front of screens and having kids and young people for hours. So we need to find that balance. So this is really after moving, moving the, the literature in really interesting ways going forward. But if there is that sense that you're disconnected, you probably haven't been thinking about these three presences. Uh, it, it comes out of work that's been done on what they call the community of inquiry. And um, especially now with our advances, what we're doing here, for example, voice over internet technologies, they allow for some pretty sophisticated levels of interaction. So the work, as I said, comes out of uh, research at the University of Calgary and Athabasca and Mount Royal. Uh, in, in, in Canada, I know there's probably similar kinds of things done, but this is really kind of cutting, cutting edge work that was done maybe even like 20, 20 years ago. So I looked at this and it was shared with me by a colleague and I said, hmm, what other presences can we bring into this community of, uh, of inquiry? And I thought immediately that uh, environmental and sustainability education has a lot to add. And following Paul's, uh, uh, presentation on bringing people outside and getting them to, to look 
there's an ecological presence, there's a place presence, environmental presence, and, and a community presence that I think when we bring that into the online space, it can really, in really enrich it. So, you know, the connection between learners, that social presence, the teacher presence, do how they get to know us, who we are as, as people, because if we don't have that face-to-face, -face, there's oftentimes things lacking in, in that re regard. So we can find ways to bring these in, and they call the cognitive presence, connections with, uh, with the content and activities and, and things of, of that, that nature. But I'm still thinking, and just thinking about it now, in real time, in, in a sense, of what, what and how we can bring these other presences in. And I'm really interested in learning from all the people here as we go through. Uh, other ideas around around doing that to make the online learning space as vibrant and experiential as it can be. So we can go to the next next slide. So yeah, that's really the, the the question. How do we connect online learning to the larger living landscape? So it's something that I've been pursuing, and I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about one aspect, and that's that's video. As we we use video, video has got sound, it's got sight, it's got movement. Uh, but oftentimes it's a very con con consumptive, you consume video. So we're looking at ways of making video even more uh, inter interactive. So we can move to the next one, Miller. Yeah, and, and I'm sure these are things that we've all done in the past, right? We have students in our courses uh, share pictures, maybe uh, spend some time in their classrooms, um, share their project and their design. We do design learning. So there's many different ways that we can do that and build on that. But I've been thinking more about how do we increase the interactivity uh, as, as, much as, we, as much as we can. So a couple of really simple ways. I just, I just talked a little bit about some of the techniques and some of the software that, that, I've, that I've used. One. Good. Okay. So, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people have probably done this already. Talked a little bit about who they are, sharing those those introductions. It gets back to that teacher presence. Uh, we often have our have our students to to introduce uh, who who they are as, as as well. So, I like to do uh, even before the class may may begin, just uh, share with people a little bit about who who I am. And you know, keep it keep it light to to get that interrelationship and those those uh, a sense of uh, who we are as human beings and people. Um, so there's a really neat little uh, software program called Powtoon. It's it's free. I whipped up just a little sample and I just wanted to see how long it would take me. And I did this just in a in a couple of minutes and it's fun and, and lighthearted. So if we can get that working, that'd be that'd be great. <laughs> And there it is. And that literally with the templates and, and the ease of use, that, that literally took me a, a couple of minutes. But getting back to, the, to the, those other presences, I often ask my students to bring in uh, maybe a question or two from that bioregional awareness quiz. I know people are familiar with that. There's many iterations of it that have been around for, for decades now. And I'm sure Paul, Paul, you're aware of it. It really asks people, like Paul was saying in his, in his uh, session there, asking people to really look and see where they, where they live. So I, I, for example, I asked people in their students, my students to ask, where, where do they come from? What bioregion do they belong to? Which one of those natural eco zones? They could be from, from anywhere in Canada uh, and they share some, some, some pictures or even a little bit of, of, of video. And to do that, I get my students to use uh, Flipgrid, which is another free and very, very simple uh, software program to use. It comes with a big green record button that you can just embed into your uh, Moodle and it's super, super simple. They can either record in real time or upload something from their phones that they've taken. So you build in that sense of, of place and, and, and community, community connection. Uh, as, as I said, video can often be, it's exciting. We get kids, we have videos we like to share. 
uh, we like to, uh, to, 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 to embed them. And, uh, but sometimes we, we, we lose that, that, that connection, that interconnectivity. Uh, here's another really simple way to, to build in some discussion. Um, it can be done asynchronously, so they don't all have to be online at the same time watching the same video, although there is software to do that. Uh, watch together, for example, is, is, is one. It's a little, I've, I've tried it, and it, it can be a little technically challenging depending on students' individual internet connections and those things. But this one called Video Ant, is, uh, it, it comes out of the University of Minnesota. It's completely free. Uh, once again, you can get it set up in a, just a couple of minutes. You just upload your video, and then you can decide where you would like the video to stop. And you can post uh, comments, annotations, questions. And then, of course, your students, you just share the link, and the students can go in and have that discussion uh, and, and talk about what they're seeing, ask themselves questions, whatever it might be. So I, I did up a little simple, quick one just to show you what it looked like on a video, two minute video by Richard Florida talking about creative communities. And it's, it's a very simple, clean, uh, clean kind of setup. So that's something that I've, I've, I've used and it takes that consumption out of it and gets people talking together about the video materials that we're, that we're using. And to the next one, yeah. And and this one, this one here, um, this is one. I, I admit I'm I'm new to this, but uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rob Power, is a huge uh, fan of video feedback for student projects. Rather than doing the traditional way, particularly online, you incorporate your own video, much like I'm doing now. You see me on the screen. Um, Screen capture software is very sophisticated and very easy to use. Screencast-O-Matic is what, uh, what we've used, and there's all free. All of these are, are free, uh, but with a very, very affordable subscription, just like a few dollars a year, uh, you, can, uh, you can upgrade, of course. You know, it takes the, uh, the advertising stamps off and that kind of thing. But there's been a lot of, uh, some research showing that there's a really increased benefit when you can speak to your students and share uh, maybe a rubric, uh, some, some uh, feedback, what you like, kind of, uh, constructive uh, criticism and, and what they can do, do the next time. So it really increases that rapport. You get a sense that you're, you're engaging with your, with your professor, your instructor, and also students really show that they, they appreciate it. It looks like it would be a huge amount of time. Oh my God, how would I ever record 40, 50, whatever, videos to they don't have to be long once you get set up it happens uh pretty intuitively uh with some pretty pretty simple steps can't go through it now but the link on that that uh that slide there to to uh, rob powers uh, blog does a beautiful job if you're interested in doing this for a small class and just getting getting a sense of what would be involved uh, he's got some really neat steps to be able to find your way around Screencast-O-Matic, capture your screen, share your rubric, talk to your students, and once again, increase that level of interactivity. It's something that I'm still playing with and learning about, but something I think I'm going to, uh, to, to, to try to, uh, to master in, in the coming year. So just a few ideas of, of working with video, bringing those presences and upping the connection to to our students, to ourselves, and to the, to the larger community. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's terrific. Um, you know, I've been experimenting not so much with video feedback, but at least audio recording my voice for feedback and saying right. that I'm getting a really positive response yep. from uh, my students because they love hearing the inflection in my voice and just That's getting that much more personal response than what they're normally yeah. This is yeah, great, great. That for sure. Thank you very much. Um, very kind of you to submit lots of resources for us too. And we'll be sending these out again as part of the resource set after this webinar is over. But with that in mind, I'm going to stop my share in this case. Um, and I would like to uh, introduce my colleague, Dr. Jeff Stickney from the Ontario Institute for Science and Education. That's Boise here at the University of Toronto. Um, Jeff, we're so pleased to have you join us today. I've been uh, really watching Jeff uh, I guess not from too far away, given that we teach in the same program, but he teaches a course uh, that's focused exclusively on environmental and sustainability education. 
uh, in our Masters of Teaching program at OISE. And um, I think this puts, puts OISE up there with a, just a few handful of institutions across the country that are doing mandatory courses for their teacher candidates in this area. Um, Jeff brings a deep background in environmental learning to this work, uh, and he has just finished uh, co-editing an issue of the full, um, Journal of Philosophy of Education, uh, which had many authors in it, uh, focused on, in fact, this very topic of environmental and sustainability ed and teacher ed. We're very happy to welcome you here today, Jeff. Thank you, Hillary. And uh, I should mention that both you and Karen Acton, who's in the audience, were, were in the um, journal. So it was really a pleasure to bring in philosophers of education working alongside environmental educators like yourselves, so creating a dialogue across these, um, these subject domains. If I can go to share screen, I'll, I'll put my PowerPoint up, but I'm gonna follow up pretty closely on what Patrick was just saying about bringing in a focus on place-based education, which is always a, a focus in my own teaching at OISE. Um, OISE is such a beautiful building that whenever I had a chance, I would get the students outdoors. So, <laughs> you know, we would uh, go a block north to Tattle Creek Park, and there there's this lovely beech tree which I'll go to here, but we're looking at a watershed, basically where Tattle Creek is part of a number of creeks and streams that run down from the Oak Ridges Moraine into Lake Ontario, and that used to be uh, in the city of Toronto or the city of York, town of York, and many old mansions and even a slave plantation sitting on these. So sharing a bit of the history of the landscape is also something that I always bring into my teaching. But here's the majestic copper beech tree, and uh, it's over 200 years old. Vanessa Alsop, who teaches science, she and I went out and measured the diameter of the tree and she shared with me an app that allows you to try and calculate the age as well as the amount of carbon that is sequestered. But you can see there's a natural amphitheater here, there's a little concrete going around the trees. So the students can sit here in the shade during the spring and summer. And then we'll talk about environmental science and also do arts-based learning right here. I, I, added a little clip from the Toronto Star about some of these wonderful trees. There's another one nearby a silver maple at Huron Elementary School and it shows the children relating to the tree there. So in an urban area you can't quite replicate a forest school but the relationship we have in these public parks is really quite important to, to foster. Here's that app carbon calculator and tree age calculator really quite fun to share with the students and something that they're not thinking of as they're standing there by the tree or sitting around the tree is the rhizosphere, the root system that is underneath them. You know, and so, you know, we do things like let's use leaf snap. Um, I naturalist as well, following up on what both speakers have just talked about. Uh, that's fun for them then to identify what type of leaf, how do we know it's a copper beech. But this was a fun activity from Neil Everenden, who did his doctorate at OISE. I won't read the whole thing, but basically he's raising this question of, you know, are you inside or outside the tree? And everyone knows intuitively, of course I'm outside the tree. But then when you start to think about the water that is being brought up through the root system, through the Cambrian layer under the bark, and then all the way to the tips of the branches, and then coming out the stoma or the mouths of the leaves at the bottom of the leaves, through evapotranspiration, you realize you're in a hydrosphere of you know, water and gases, and that the tree can be releasing aerosol gases that you're breathing in. This is something Diana Bursford Kroger talks about in Call of the Forest, that these trees also have healing capacities. So this is that sort of critical thinking we get them engaged on. And because Neil was working with Martin Heidegger as his philosopher for environmental education, he was also thinking of the concept of mitzain, of dwelling with things and being with the tree and language. And that's really hard for them to get. But the point is I would share with them through Heidegger and Wittgenstein is the minute you saw the copper beech tree as a tree, as soon as you saw that and said, ah, oh, that's a tree or a beech tree, you are a tree in language. And that's kind of mystifying to them. But I get them doing art-based activities while I'm talking about the tree and talking about what's going on in the wood wide web below their feet. And that concept that there might be hundreds of kilometers of interconnected roots is really new to them. They love that concept of the wood wide web. So here through erosion, we can see it exposed. And I share with them the clip Judy Dench from My Passion for Trees, where she uses a hydrosphere, where now you can hear in infrasound, the sound of the water surging up through the tree. Really lovely to share some of these documentaries, which they can then link to. 
But Suzanne Simard has a wonderful TED talk on how trees talk to one another. And it introduces the concept of mother trees or hub trees. Um, in Richard Power's novel, The Overstory, Patricia Westerford is that character, Suzanne Simard, with maybe an overlap as well with Diana Bursford Kroger, our Irish Canadian tree expert, um, chemist and botanist who has written The Global Forest and, and now Who Will Speak for the Trees, her recent book. But you see, I've embedded in this a clip, tree roots are inside and outside the tree. And that's where I filmed myself using an iPhone out in the forest. And I went to a local tree because I couldn't get down to the campus. And then um, they can use their login through the University of Toronto, very much like what Patrick was sharing. Um, I'm glad you mentioned you, University of Minnesota. That was my undergraduate school. Um, so um, this was an, a free storage site, and I don't need to use Vimeo then. I can store this for free on my library at University of Toronto, and then the students can also access, access it. So in these PowerPoints, I use insert audio, and then I can tape myself, but you have to be careful. The file size gets really big, and then can you still upload it onto your platform? So by using these embedded links, it allows you then to include footage um, I actually filmed myself on the Oak Ridge's Moraine introducing the course and then rendezvoused with my partner Karen here. And then we talked about art and, and trees and, and we talked about it in relation to the Fibonacci series and fractal geometries. So I think these are fun, especially when you're working with student teachers, teacher candidates that are in all the different subject areas. And of course, since 2009 in Ontario, that's been our mission in the curriculum is to embed ESC in all of the subject domains. Here's Diana Bursford Kroger, a link to her, her documentary, Call of the Forest. Uh, Diana was also in our recent journal. Simon Heath, an actor um, and novelist, um, interviewed her and then I helped co-write a paper there. And you can see Richard, um, uh, uh, Richard Powers' novel, the, o the Overstory there. This is the one I'm reading now. This is Greenwood by Michael Christie. And again, it includes a lot of really good natural science. Um, it's dealing with trees and the great withering that might happen in the future. So it's really a wonderful read. So sharing with the students literature that brings them in to botany, or as they call it, dendrology, and our connection to trees is like really important. Here's C.D. Wright, Casting Deep Shade and her love of beech trees, and so bringing in poetry. And um, Hillary teaches arts-based learning. I, I share with them, here's a clip from Merle, Merleau Ponty, Maurice Merleau Ponty, about when a painter paints a tree, how they become one with the tree. It's another sense in which, following up on Heidegger and other phenomenologists, that as you see the tree, you are with the tree. So here again, I've recorded myself on aesthetic perception. And then it gets the students out in my local area. But what am I doing? It's, it's not just theater. Uh, edutainment in a way. I'm saying, hey, for your final project in our course, why don't you go to a local area near you? So the students go out to to um, Grenadier Pond, they go out in Hyde Park, they, they look into what was the indigenous history of our area? What can I learn through archival information? I had students go under the 401 in the ravines and record soundscapes if they're students in music. And it's really meaningful for them. One student was doing our course online, but she was in Quebec at a camp. So she went out in her canoe and as an English candidate, she was really talking about the concept of the North and Canada as, you know, the great North, especially for the Americans. I used to live in Minnesota, so I know the sense of Canada being North. But I mean, it was really quite fascinating in terms of really how far to the South we are in, in terms of North America and its reach up into the Arctic. Here again is the drawing activity. I do this with my students. I give them a sketch pad and pencils, um, and, and then they go at writing, um, or sorry, drawing either a part of the tree or a whole tree. Um, sometimes they'll say, look at the carvings in the tree, but you might add words, you might do poetry, or some of them even get into doing slam poetry, which is really fun. I had one student sing an aria while touching the tree, really quite beautiful. But I did this as well at Oxford, a new college, with a group of professors. I said, let's get outdoors. Let's leave the, the lecture hall. So we went out under the medieval wall and went to the medieval cloister where the um, evergreen oak tree is, uh, Quercus uh, Ilus, um, uh, an evergreen oak tree. And, and it's most famous as being Harry Potter tree. And then we talked about how do you see this tree as something other than a film set? How do we see it for an invasive species that is different from 
uh, Quercus robur, the, the English oak tree, and then what are the problems, for, for instance, of these trees coming in, and also how is it endangered as we stand around it? Are we compressing the soil and uh, causing uh, oxygen not to be able to break down leaf matters and making water run off? I mean, are we actually contributing to the killing of the tree because the branch that Malfoy sat on in Harry Potter, it's been cut down because it died, you know, and so it is a, a tree in its, in its final years. So maybe I'll stop there, but many of the students found this very rewarding to do their own place-based inquiry, and then they bring in their use of media, they bring in their use of their own phones, and, and then the different apps, and make it relevant to their own, their own, um, their own interests, their own teaching subjects, and um, their, their locale. Well, and Becca's popped a comment in the chat about using the Closer You Look activity from Project Learning Tree with students. Um, I think in a, a similar kind of way, uh, she's said that she's used it both uh, synchronously and in person, and it's worked uh, well in both cases. Students are drawing their mind's eye tree as, as well as then drawing an actual tree. And I've done similar things with my students, uh, Becca, and you're right, it's very effective because they realize that the mind's eye tree is a completely different entity than a, than a real tree. When young people draw trees, they almost never draw the root system. So they're leaving out a third to half right. the stream. And so that's a funny thing of what we don't see, but it's there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate your ideas. Your slides are so beautifully composed, which is why I had you share them today. We were going to lose the formatting on them otherwise. And they're, they're just uh, they're mini works of art all in their, in their own right. Now, I'm going to take a slightly different angle at this. Um, what I'd like to raise today is the opportunities that the pandemic can provide for us uh, in terms of reaching new audiences. And um, what we've been working on at OISE, and I am the lead in uh, environmental and sustainability ed at OISE. I'm also a faculty member who teaches both art education as well as environmental mental education and um, we've been running a, a special uh, uh, collaboration with the Toronto District School Board for uh, we're just towards the end of our third year at this point and we're on the verge of renewing it for another three years where we'd be bringing pre-service so teacher candidates together with practicing teachers that's the in-service piece uh, to do professional learning together and this has been a really exciting project for us and it's uh, really opened up a whole new range uh, and a much broader range of event uh, programming around environmental education uh, than we've been able to do on our own in the past. So that's a whole other piece that I can certainly encourage um, to look to partnerships with the local school boards to bring teachers and teacher candidates together. Because when the teacher candidates can see teachers doing this work in environmental and sustainability, I think they're much more likely to do it themselves. But you know, there, there were challenges with this. It was hard to get teachers and teacher candidate schedules to align for major events at times that work both uh, well for both groups. Um, certainly it was hard to um, sometimes find the right avenues for promoting these events, uh, getting teachers um, and TCs um, that are new to environmental and sustainability ed is sometimes a, a bit of a trick. Um, and certainly we have two large bureaucracies, so dealing with the red tape is always a challenge. But, you know, the pandemic presented a challenge all of a sudden last spring that we really had never encountered before. And we thought initially that we were going to have to shut everything down and that would be the end of it. But then when we started thinking about the opportunities that online learning presents, we realized, in fact, that there were a whole new set of opportunities that the pandemic would present. So um, we realized that uh, teachers and teacher candidates really had some free time all of a sudden to undertake professional learning, in, certainly in larger amounts, um, more frequently than they had previously because of other responsibilities. And many of them, because they were isolated at home, were looking for ways to connect with others who shared their interests and their passions. We also found that we had speakers who had time on their hands because of course all of their events had been canceled in person. And we um, realized that online learning was a really quite accessible to many. I won't say to all, because not everybody has access to the digital technology, but many, many people have access to it uh, who are involved in education. And we discovered that our costs were really low. OISE already had a professional Zoom account for us, so we weren't adding any new technology in. It was really quite, um, quite affordable for us to move forward with this. And we also discovered that our planning time was greatly reduced. We could just plan a couple of weeks in advance, and as long as we were always sharing this information in the same places, people knew where to go looking for it. So we decided to jump on it, and this is the results. Um, over um, from April to July, this last spring, we were able to offer 17 professional learning events and we had over a thousand people in attendance. This is a brand new record for us, I have to admit. <laughs> um, you know, we're used to getting sort of 30-ish people 
TCs and um, teachers uh, engaged in our in our learning events on campus. So all of a sudden to have well over a thousand involved was a, was a brand new thing once we moved online. We were able to cover a really wide range of topics and bring in the voices of a really wide range of experts, which was great. Everything from outdoor learning to nature journaling to reconciliation and gardening was one of the favorite ones from last spring. Um, and even how to do ESE learning with K-12 students online. We were able to grow our contact list, which was fantastic because, of course, when people pre-register pre like you did today for their Zoom sessions, you're able to capture uh, email to communicate with them, which was uh, really wonderful. And finally, we have been able to develop this archive now of 17 webinars from last spring and then this fall, we're continuing to add to that. So when teachers say, well, I need some information about, you say, oh, we've got a, we've got a webinar in this you can watch and we we're able to direct them back to that. And then I think the best part here was that we um, had teachers involved, not only in attending the webinars, but then immediately going and trying these things with their own students. Now in the spring, it was all online learning in Canada, uh, where we are anyway. And so we were um, having teachers come back immediately within a, within a week or two and say, oh, I mean, we tried out these ideas and this is what's resulted. So what you're looking at are just three samples of, of things that teachers shared with us. Um, kindergarten work on the left-hand side. Uh, in the middle, it was a choice board um, done with emojis, a bit emojis, which was really fun. And on the right-hand side, um, some worksheets, digital worksheets that another teacher uh, was able to create with their students. So again, the advantage is that we would typically have a part two workshop. We would present one workshop and then four to six weeks later, present a second workshop. We could invite the same people who attended the first time, plus anybody else on the growing email list. And teachers were able to share what they actually did with the learning in the first case. So we were really able to amplify teachers' voices, which was wonderful, and share their results. This proved to be really popular. Teachers loved learning from other teachers, and of course our teacher candidates loved learning from practicing teachers as well. So this really became a win-win, I think, all the way around. One of our most popular ones, I have to tell you though, does provide a model for virtual field trips. And I'm, I've linked to this, so when you get sent these slides, you can tap into it if you want to take a look. Um, Isaac uh, Crosby is uh, a really a, a wonderful urban farmer. Uh, he's uh, of indigenous heritage. And he leads um, a, a great learning garden at a place called Evergreen Brickworks here in the city of Toronto. And he did the most wonderful walking tour of his garden. And I still don't know how he did it, but he was able to read the chat room simultaneously. And he wasn't doing that by peering into his phone. <laughs> he was doing that from a distance and he still hasn't shared that secret with me. But he was able to walk around and simultaneously share information, his, his expertise with people, but also respond automatically to uh, questions in the chat room as well. So there is a, there's a nice model there, I think, to follow for virtual field trips that are truly interactive with others. So just a couple of strategies. Please take some risks when you do this work. This was a brand new thing. We really felt we were diving into the deep end with Zoom webinars. We had never done these before, uh, but they've worked out really well. It does take a little bit of time to get to know Zoom or whatever platform you're using, but it does become second nature after a while. Um, be generous, share that professional learning with teachers and teacher candidates simultaneously. And if you don't have those contacts, I'm sure if you reach out to teachers and local school boards, uh, to consultants in those school boards, that they would be thrilled to promote uh, anything that you can offer in your faculties of education. Do make it current. You know, our whole um, program this fall is connecting to two main things. One is outdoor learning because of the pandemic here in Ontario. There's a lot of teachers taking their students outside and they want to know how to do that. So we started that process. We had over 600 people sign up for the first webinar focused on outdoor learning. So you just need to hit the right topic. And I think there's an unlimited audience really um, to, to tap into these things. Our next one is on notions of how environmental education can um, be uh, can contribute to a just recovery. And then we're also going to be doing a lot of work on environmental racism and injustice and eco-justice education this fall as well. And then finally, this is a great opportunity to develop your network, uh, to help promote opportunities for teachers and teacher candidates more broadly. Uh, working with Paul and Jacob Rodenberg, who is just actually in the, um, in the room with us. Uh, we're talking about actually developing a whole series of um, uh, eco-mentor program based on Paul and Jacob's program that might go to teacher candidates across the country. So we've got this wonderful opportunity to try these things for the first time, and I am hoping that's really gonna show even more growth moving forward. At this point, I'd like you to, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Becca Franzen, and I, I think Becca might be qualified as the most experienced of us all because she's been running a wonderful series of 
uh, webinars and, and digital meetings for people uh, across uh, North America and I think from around the world, Becca, um, that has people share strategies just like this uh, from higher education. So um, Becca earned her, her BS from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, and she's worked in a whole variety of roles in environmental education centers and camps for people with disabilities. Uh, she has seen a need to better connect with local communities, and so she went back to school to get her master's degree in human and community resources, and then went on to complete her doctoral degree in um, curriculum and instruction with a specialization in science, uh, science, social studies, and environmental education integration from Northern uh, Illinois University. Uh, she now teaches courses at uh, the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, with um, a focus in foundations of environmental education, environmental education methods, environmental uh, issues, investigations, uh, and graduate seminar. So um, she focuses on pre-service teacher education in environmental education and environmental literacy in her research. So uh, with that, Becca, welcome. And we're looking forward to learning a little bit more about what you learned from everybody over running the NAAEE uh, webinars over the last six months. Sure, great. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to drop in the chat a link to the EE Pro Higher Education site and just point it out to you because it can be somewhat difficult to navigate. So you should see it on your screen now. Um, but I'm a, a moderator for the higher education group um, within EE Pro. And you are able to just log in and join for free. And if you go to the higher education group, you can scroll down um, and you'll see here Hillary's post about this event. But you'll see here, see this page of 768 views? That's where you can find out information about what's been going on and what's coming up in terms of the weekly meetings. The next one is this next Friday, October 2nd, not tomorrow. Um, but then way down low here, a lot of people miss this, is that there's a group file sharing area that might end up being helpful for you where you can access some resources that people have shared. Um, there's a lot of other resources though that folks have shared. I'm gonna drop another link in the chat that might be helpful for you as you consider what options and opportunities there are. And these are things that have been shared um, in those conversations that we've been having every other week. So here's a link to a Google Drive and we're working on the organization of it, um, but that might be just something to stick in your back pocket. Um, one thing we have in there that's a newer addition is a listing of people's names who've participated. We've had over 100 people participate in these conversations, typically each week, 10 to 15 folks. Um, but we've talked about how we could use that email list to contact each other with ideas, assignment ideas. Um, if we run into problems, if we start getting sick uh, as educators, like that we could contact someone and ask, do you have a recording about this particular topic or could you be a guest speaker for me? Um, so I wanted to share those with you. And then I also thought it would be fun um, for us to try out some of the activities because I find that I hear a lot of really great ideas, but then just like was shared, so many wonderful ideas. But then I'm like, well, how would I really implement that? Or how would I do that? So we're gonna play a game. Um, I want you to click on the participants button on the bottom of your screen, and then you'll see everybody's name on the side. Um, their names will pop up. Not, you, won't, you might not be able to see everybody because you might have your chat open. But then underneath the names, you see the voting buttons, yes and no. This is how we vote in our faculty meetings now. Um, but I want you to use those yes and no buttons. And I'm gonna read you some statements that I read to students uh, in a freshman level class, a first year students, um, this last week. So answer yes or no. In the, past, uh, in the past six months, have you ridden a bike, walked or taken the bus instead of driven a car? So you can mark yes or no. All right, great. And then I can see everybody's votes pop up, right? And then I can click on clear all and it clears all of those. And I can ask the next question. Um, have you studied without turning on the lights to save electricity? You can click yes or no, right? And again, we can see the responses. So it's kind of like that game, um, have you ever or I've never, but it's something that you can play pretty easily in an online format. Depending on what you're in, I use Zoom to teach synchronously. Um, so I wanted to share that with you and just get you thinking about, about that kind of thing as far as student engagement. Um, I had a student last week tell me that it feels like I'm in the room with her. I'm like, that's good. I want you to think I'm in your bedroom with you or your car or wherever you are. You are. So I also encourage students to change the name on the screen. Um, you can see Hillary and I have modified ours to add the she, her. So I do that every time I come into the room and I invite my students to, to indicate the names that they would like to use as well. 
And Becca, by the way, the way you modify that permanently so you don't have to do it every meeting is you go into your settings in Zoom and you add your, for your pronouns to your last name and then they'll come up every time. Thank you for pointing that out. I keep forgetting, I need to do that. Thank you, yes, so go to your Zoom setting. All right, then I wanted to share one other tool because this I think is a really good one. So I teach synchronously online for almost all of my classes. We're in Zoom and I want them to get to know each other um, and I want them to do some group work, but it's like, how do I spy on them? Because if you enter into their breakout rooms, they, they notice you. Mm -hmm. I have found if you're muted, video muted and sound muted, they don't notice you as much. Um, but I've gone to trying out different, um, sh different forms that I can watch them while they're working. And it was suggested uh, in one of our bi-weekly meetings that we have that you break them up just randomly. And then if you want to assign students to a particular room, you first have them go to their randomly assigned breakout room and say hello and introduce themselves or share something. And then while they're in those rooms, you can adjust them and put them in specific rooms. When you go there um, to your room, uh, a message will pop up that will say join, click on join, and then also click on that, that link that I put in there that starts with Jamboard, it's a Google item. And in your groups, whatever group you're in, you're gonna work on the appropriate page. So if you're group one, you'll work on group one page. You'll see the first like easel sheet and you'll, you can play with the features on the side. I often have students use what's called sticky notes and then they can write their ideas on sticky notes and they can be rearranged later. So what I'm doing while they're doing that work is then I'm, you know, instead of just going and getting more coffee, um, I'm scrolling through their pages and I can see what it is that they're, what it is that they're thinking about and if there's no one working, I can bop into their room and I can say, do you have a problem in here? Or, or I can broadcast a message that says, don't forget to do this, right? So it allows me just to, it's just one way to see them working. I also do that through like OneDrive or Google yeah. Docs. And Becca, that's how I've been using it. I've been using, it, using Google, like one, we use one Google Doc for the class. Each group has to put their group, their individual names assigned to a group when they're in their breakout room. And I find peer pressure is working really well because they see other groups moving along with the learning task. They don't want to be the only group that doesn't have something uh, up in the Google Doc. So that's another, another really great strategy I learned from somebody else. Yeah, right. It's just so handy to be able to see, yeah. to be able to see what it is that they're doing while, while they're doing it. Just again, the links to the higher ed group, the Google Drive that we're consolidating resources in. And then I invite all of you to come to our every other Friday meetings. Um, and there are some folks that were on the call that have participated in those and have contributed so many great ideas. And then um, there's my email if I can be a resource for you too. Thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate it. We've also got some print resources, some good old fashioned print resources for people. Uh, if that interests, uh, we encourage you to take a look um, especially as, as many of you, I think, in the room today have got chapters in the Environmental and Sustainability Education and Teacher Ed book that's new out from Springer in the last six months. So we encourage you to take a look at that one as well. Thank you so much for attending today. Uh, we encourage those who would like to stay on the room uh, for a chat, but can I just ask you to join me in thanking our, uh, our speakers for sharing their ideas today. It was a really great uh, quick way to get an introduction to some of the work that's being done in ESE and teacher education these days. Thank you to all of you.